Dr. Ken Cooey. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I've kind of narrowed down the talk to uh, evidence and video presentation demonstration of the Encompass procedure only just for the, the sake of time. I'm happy to go over PBI and Convergent as well, but I think this, this really blends together nicely the, the talks we've already heard this morning from Dr. Lyons and Dr. Gilanoff. So here are my disclosures. So as you just heard from Dr. Lyons, when you look at the Medicare population, this is a recent study of about 100,000 Medicare uh, patients from the US. About 80% of patients that surgeons take to the operating room who have a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation only have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And as you heard earlier, unfortunately, most of these patients still are not treated. So only about 20% of these patients are treated, roughly about half with an LAA, and then about half with a surgical ablation. What does it look like real world in our STS in the US data? Well, if you look at about the 300,000 cabbages that are performed, about 30% of patients have AFib. And as we learned earlier as well, the mechanism does seem to be different. If you have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, this is a trigger-based pathology, but if you have more advanced atrial fibrillation, persistent or long-standing persistent, this is really driven by drivers which require interruption. Why is this important? Because if we think about paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, which again is the most common patient that we will see who has coronary disease undergoing a cabbage, our viable options really just need to address isolating the triggers. And as you heard, these are mainly in the, in the posterior wall of the pulmonary veins. And so we can simply do this by isolating the posterior wall or posterior wall isolation. And then we mitigate the stroke risk by managing the left atrial appendage. Yes, indeed, you can do a biatrial maze. That's a fantastic operation, even for somebody who has paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. But let's focus on maybe that sweet spot is how I think of it. Maybe somebody who, has, who only needs their posterior wall isolated and then management of the left atrial appendage. So this is the box lesion that was uh, spoke to earlier. So you manage the appendage with the nature clip, and then you isolate the posterior wall with the encompass clamp. And what this looks like electrophysiologically, this is a patient who we had mapped post encompass. And you can see here how nicely in the gray, the pulmonary veins are isolated uh, from the posterior wall, as well as the confluence of the, the pulmonary veins in the back of that posterior atrium. So that entire posterior wall has been nicely isolated by the encompass clamp. Now, truly the advantage for the coronary patient is no atriotomy is needed. No posterior dissection is required. You can do this without cross clamp. So in most instances, I will not cross clamp in the aorta and arrest. So no additional cross clamp time. And then there's no change in cannulation. So you can stick to your standard uh, two-stage venous cannulation through the right atrium if you are using cardiopulmonary bypass. So just a couple videos. So the first step is developing the oblique sinus. So simply you want to get around the IVC between the inferior vena cava and the inferior pulmonary vein on the right. You want to make sure you develop this space widely. The next step is then to develop what is essentially called the neotransverse sinus. So as you all know, the transverse sinus exists behind the pulmonary artery and the aorta. All you want to do at this point is connect that natural sinus to the right pericardium beyond the SVC. So what you see here is I've simply uh, scored some of that fat on the dome of the left atrium near that SVC right pulmonary vein juncture. And then I'm just using my finger to develop that space. Again, you want that space widely open in order to be able to pass this red rubber guide and as well as the, the encompass clamp. So after these sinuses are developed, I then take the red rubber guide, I pass it from the patient's left to right, first through the natural sinus, then I just use my fingers to pass it under the SVC. This can also be done with a clamp. Uh, I just prefer to use it with my fingers. 
You can see how nicely that's now passed all the way through the, the natural sinus over to the right pericardium. The next step is then to take this red rubber guide, pass it around the apex of the LV. So now you're really in that posterior space. And now through that uh, developed oblique sinus, you simply just want to pass the red rubber there. So essentially now you've lassoed the entire posterior left atrium with the red rubber. You then take the two ends of the red rubber, you hook that up to the encompass clamp, which you saw a picture of earlier. So the one going through the transverse sinus to the upper jaw, the one going through the oblique sinus to the lower jaw, again, standard cannulation for an on-pump coronary bypass, close the jaw, and I like to bring it through parallel to the sternal retractor, so I'm bringing it into the well. I partially open it in a controlled fashion. I then tilt the clamp towards the left shoulder. Remember, that's the natural direction of the sinuses. So that's how you want the clamp directed. I then check the tip of the clamp with the red rubber with a yank hour. So I make sure it's all directed uh, to that left shoulder in the direction of the sinuses. And then I let the red rubber do most of the work and the clamp just simply falls into place. So you should be able to do that without any resistance at all. If there is resistance, then your sinuses likely are not developed enough or there's some other obstruction. So again, really you want this to be a resistance-free movement. And then I pull the left atrial appendage with my left hand to make sure that the clamp is indeed beyond that. So lateral to the left atrial appendage so that I do not inadvertently clamp and ablate the left atrial appendage. So the steps, the specific critical steps. So again, you have your echocardiographer check the left atrial appendage prior to this to make sure there's no thrombus. Place an aortic root vent and make sure that's open and on. Anytime you do any sort of surgical ablation, you can create marker bubbles and things like that. And since you are already going on pump, use that to your advantage. Make sure the echo is pulled back behind the left atrium so it's not tenting the esophagus up towards the clamp. Go ahead and then clamp and then lift it slightly off the posterior pericardium so that the back of the clamp is not in contact with that pericardium so you don't get collateral damage. Make sure that the posterior pericardium is dry and then check your, your, check your clamp position and perform at least three transmural applications. This could take either one or two or three sequences through the, the algorithm. And then when you're done, you can release the clamp and you can uh, test the veins to see if you have an intact box. What's really nice is you get real-time EKG feedback. It's what's beautiful is to be able to watch a patient go from atrial fibrillation into sinus uh, when you complete the ablation. And here's some real world data. This is unpublished. Again, this is non-randomized. This is just retrospective data from six centers with various follow-up just to kind of give a taste of, of where these results may uh, lead in the future. About 84% of patients were, were discharged in, in sinus rhythm. About one month out, 90% of patients using this technique were in sinus rhythm. And as you would expect, as that inflammatory process resolves, a slightly higher rate, about 92%, were in sinus rhythm at last follow-up at four months. So very early data, but very promising. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.